Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for inviting me to come here. I'm, I feel like a little bit of an interloper in this meeting because I'm not a microbiologist at all. I'm an engineer. Um, I do work with people who do microbiology and I can, I can plate things out on agar, but that's about as far as my knowledge goes in that sense. So um, I'm going to perhaps try and get you to thinking about something a little bit different and thinking about the relationship between microbes in the environment and the actual environment itself and how particularly airflow works in this space. Um, I haven't worked in space at all, so I'm going to talk mostly about um, uh, ventilation on Earth, um, but perhaps try and think about where it might differ as well. And most of the work that we've looked at has been related to airflows in hospitals and thinking about risks of infection. Um, so I'm going to start off with those risks of infection and think about airborne transmission of infection. Um, and think about it in terms of what the physics is doing here. So we've obviously got some sort of source um, of infectious particles. Um, we tend to think of those as coming from a cough or a sneeze, but actually they could come from all kinds of environmental sources too. Um, so they might come from your shower or your toilet or some sort of um, um, procedures, all kinds of things in there. They will be in the form of an aerosol, so they might be microbes suspended in a liquid, so you've got then a microorganism with a small layer of liquid around it, or they might be particles, so they might be microorganisms suspended on, say, skin particles. Whatever they are, they've got a particular size distribution, and they will be released from a particular location, in a particular direction, with a particular velocity, et cetera, depending on how they, where they are. And that might be something that you could assume is being released in a fairly constant manner. So certain environmental sources, for example, uh, your building um, heating ventilation system could be releasing something almost continually. Um, or it could be something very transient that happens once in a puff, and then you don't see it again for maybe another week. And those are very hard to find. So once they are released in the air, they'll be transported. And where they get transported depends on the local air flows in that environment. So they might travel big distances. They might travel between rooms. They might travel around a whole building. They might even travel between buildings. Um, and in fact, actually, if they get released into the upper atmosphere, microorganisms can cross you know, between continents. Um, and uh, yeah, that's a whole different fascinating topic of its own. Um, but some of them will deposit. And then, of course, we're interested from an infection point of view is do they expose people? And how do they expose people? Well, how well they expose people depends on did they survive their journey through the environment. When they do get to somebody, are they still in the air? If they are, what size particles are they still? Because that will determine whereabouts do they deposit in your lung if you inhale them. So do you inhale them? Do they deposit onto surfaces and then they're in touch contact transmission route? Do they actually deposit sort of directly onto your mucous membranes? And a, a, I suppose a short range aerosol transmission. And this process is incredibly complicated because of course, even if just, I've only really talked about the physics there, but the whole microbial part of this is in there. Human behavior characteristics influence it as well because nothing's nice and static. So all of this will be influenced by all the people moving around. And then, of course, my world, which is the world of engineering and the fluid dynamics, which is to understand how that ties, how that sort of takes, ties this all together. Um, and it's very complicated. So this, I can't take any credit whatsoever for this video. This was done by uh, Gary Settles at Penn State. But it's a, a lovely video which really shows the complexity of flow around a person. So every single one of you, you're warmer than the environment that you're in, even in Texas and you have a thermal plume above your head. And that's this buoyant convection that we've heard about already uh, today. As you watch her breathe, you can see her breathe out of her nose, and then she coughs. And when she coughs, that cough penetrates quite a long way. And it actually penetrates outside of what we call the boundary layer flow, which is around her. Um, this is incredibly complex. You can see just in the, in, the, in the video how complex that flow is and how that flow will influence what happens. And of course, on space, in space, um, that flow will change. So that buoyant convective plume won't be there in the same way. But the other flows, when you breathe out of your nose, when you cough, they will be there because they're momentum-driven flows. Back to thinking about these aerosols in the, in the built environment, where do they come from? And I'm, this is from a, a hospital-type context. 
Some of them come from water systems. And I've put this on here because actually this is increasingly important in a hospital environment. We're starting to recognize that water, water systems and drains are really important for infection transmission. We get some aerosols that come from jets that break up. So if you think of your shower, your shower is lots of thin jets emitted from a thing that looks a little bit like a sieve. Those jets will break up into droplets and depending on the airflow around them and the speed of those droplets and the flow regime they're in, you will get some aerosol formed from those. And the formation of that is really, really complex. You again, you get it from taps, and depending on whether you've got a, the design of your tap, you'll get a different one in there. I've also put urination in there, because when I was looking for videos on this for another talk on the internet, I found in, apparently you get aerosolization from urination. Um, you get splash aerosols. Um, this happens all the time, so when you flush your toilet, you create a splash that creates a droplet formation and creates an aerosol. When your shower or your tap it hits the surfaces of the shower cubicle or the sink, you get a formation from there. The physics of it is very complex. You get a, a sort of splash form where you get this little strange corona-shaped thing, and that forms little droplets off it, um, and anything where you spill something. So those are, flow, those are aerosol sources that come from water. We then have aerosol sources, which I guess I've said are driven by the air. So ventilation flows, so where you've got the ventilation system in a building, that, will, um, that potentially can release particles, can drive particles through and aerosols. Also drainage systems in buildings, actually that they are, we tend to think of them for where water goes, but the biggest risk with drainage systems in buildings is when the air flows through them instead, and that's what um, drives an aerosol from those. And there are certain places where you get atomization, um, so certain clinical procedures, even some showers, low flow showers. I think in Texas you have a lot of low flow showers, so you may actually be atomizing the water in some of those. And all of these are the environmental sources, and of course as well, on top of those you've got the human sources from coughing and, and the, things like that. Just to give you some idea of some of the sizes we're interested in here, this is just some data from papers around cough aerosol. So um, there's not that much data around measuring cough aerosol from people with infections, but there's a lot from healthy volunteers. Typically, people are producing droplets between about 3 and 200 microns. Um, they will very rapidly evaporate, leaving things that are much smaller in the air. So we're interested in these small droplets. And there are a number of studies, which um, a fairly small number, but there are studies that have shown that people with particular pathogens, this one is pseudomonas, so people with cystic fibrosis who have pseudomonas, that can be aerosolized in a cough, can be sampled from a cough, and can be found up to four meters away. So that is, survives and can be, and so it becomes a potential transmission route. Um, so obviously I'm an engineer thinking about how do you control this? Um, in an infection control perspective, we're thinking how do you break that chain of transmission? Um, so you can't necessarily stop, particularly if the, the source, particularly if it's a person, um, but you can try and then prevent whatever comes from that person when they cough, thank you. Um, <laughs> to where it goes, you should never cough in my talk. <laughs> um, so we can do this through ventilation. The basic principle of our ventilation in most buildings is you dilute the air, so the, the greater the air change rate or flow rate you have in a room, the quicker you'll dilute something out of that room and remove it. You can do them more sophisticated by actually changing how you distribute that air to preferentially remove in certain places more than others or preferentially provide um, fresh air in certain places. You can use pressure. So you we use pressure in, for example, operating rooms in hospitals, isolation rooms, and I guess airlocks and things, because that is your, your differential pressure between two zones, which tries to keep something in one place and prevent it going to another. Um, we regularly use local extraction. You'll all be familiar with that with your cooker hood. You're trying to take something out before it goes out into the rest of your environment. And of course, things like temperature and humidity, we've already seen, if you control that correctly, you limit your microbial growth and therefore you limit your, your, your risks in there. 
We can use additional technology on top of that, so filtration. We've already heard that filtration is a very important part of the ventilation system on the ISS. Um, we can do other things, like we can use various technologies like ultraviolet disinfection to clean or to decontaminate air, um, surface technologies, um, um, PPE. Um, and I think we can also use the engineering control to promote certain actions. So you can use smart building controls, or you can even use things to promote people to, if, for example, in a hospital, if you position things right, they will wash their hands rather than if you put, put the sink in the wrong place. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about how do we go about understanding which of these actions to take, and what, how do we get some evidence to support this, and particularly how do we model it? Because the reality is you can't just I can't just go into a hospital, release um, something microbial and see what happens. I will get um, in quite a lot of trouble for that. So when we can get data from environments, we know outbreaks happen. And the problem with most outbreaks is we know where the source is. We know some of the effects of it. We don't necessarily know the bits that happened in between. We don't know how did something get from A to B. So we might know it's in the water it's in a patient, how did it get from the water to that patient? Did it go in an aerosol? Did it go in a droplet splash? Did it go by some touch contact route? We don't know. So we're trying to figure out what might happen in these environments. Okay, so we do go into hospital type environments and we'll do a certain amount of sampling in there. It can be very, as many of you will know, it can be quite challenging to get into a hospital environment in the first place to do that sampling. Um, particularly if you don't belong to that hospital. Uh, sometimes it's easier for some people than others. Um, and then even then, you, you, know, you can't necessarily conduct an experiment. You really are trying to sample that environment as it is and make some judgments from it. So, oops. We will then often use proxy models. So we do a lot of work using chamber studies. So we have, uh, we're actually very lucky. We have a biological aerosol chamber, so we can actually aerosolize microorganisms. Um, in a controlled manner, see what happens to them. But we also use that type of chamber for gas tracer studies as well to look at what, how the airflow is behaving. And we can gain a lot of information from that, um, from experimentally to understand, you know, how does the ventilation change things? How do the conditions change things? What if we put some technology in there? Even that doesn't tell us everything because again, we know we can measure certain things in certain places it's impossible to instrument the entire room, so you still have to infer what you get from that. So we can then move to things, for example, scale models. And this is an example of a scale model here. This is a, a water analog where you, you, the water is like the air, and then you can use a dye tracer, and you can use this to visualize what's happening. This is a really simple one that one of my students did where um, the, the little cylinder moves up and down here. The, the, the tank represents a corridor, and the cylinder represents a person walking up, people walking up and down that corridor, and how they might disperse that contaminant. Um, anybody who's ever walked down a corridor behind somebody who's smoking, and you get a big slug of it when you breathe in? A little bit like that. Um, what I'm really going to talk about today is, is some of the more modeling-based work. So we do a lot of work using computational fluid dynamics and other flow modeling type methods where we can not just visualize, but it's quantitative. and We can understand the details of what the flow paths are like in that environment. And this just shows a, a chamber environment where we've got a, a source in the middle. This is a heated mannequin and you've released something from this source and you can see the concentration contours of where that's going in that room and how it mixes in that airflow in that room. And then we also try and tie this in with infection risk models. So not just to say, where does it go in the room, but actually what might this mean in terms of transmission risk um, and, and then to try and understand some of the factors that matter in that. And we use, link this in with often quite conventional infection risk models, um, which anybody who's ever done mathematical modeling of infection risk would have seen some of these types of models. Um, so talk a little bit more about this. So computational fluid dynamics is, is one of the main techniques we use. So it's a numerical simulation technique. For Some of you will probably be familiar with it. Others will have never seen it before. Um, it, it basically, you, you, you're creating a, a simulation, computer simulation of that environment. 
you're solving a bunch of equations that describe the fluid flow in that environment numerically. Um, and it allows you to resolve in those time and space things like the velocity, the temperatures, the pressures in that room, and then employ other models on top of that to look at where do your contaminants go. And it's the contaminants that we tend to be quite interested in because they are really important. That, you know, they give us an idea of where things, where things are going to go. And we can use this to look at distribution. So we can look at the, the overall ventilation effectiveness. We can look at how ventilation methods and regimes change things. But then we can look into some of the details about how the local effects change things or look at things like systems and things. So I've got a couple of examples to show you from some of the studies we've done. Uh, the first study here is around personalized ventilation. So this was my student, Natalie, who did this work. Um, and Natalie's model is a simple case where you've got a, a person, this is a computational thermal mannequin or CTM, in an environment. And then personalized ventilation, the idea with this is that you supply the air, instead of ventilating the whole room, you ventilate the person instead. So it's a little bit like in your car where you've got the jets close to you and it's supplying air to you rather than to the rest of the space. And if it's done well, it provides a lot better control. So it provides you more local control to your comfort and your air quality. And in a room, ring in a room like this, it's quite energy efficient because you know the air is going to the people. We don't care what the air's like up there. I care what it's like down here where we're breathing it in a room like this. Okay, so again, we've used this computational fluid dynamics modeling to explore this and to understand some of the detail of the parameters. There are a lot of studies that show this methodology works but nobody would really looked at the flow dynamics before. Um, so we can look at things like flow paths and look at the difference in um, the positioning of our, of our um, PV device, so two different distances away. This one's, um, this one's further away than this one, it's much closer, and different temperatures and how it affects that. Remember that thermal plume above somebody's head, how the different positioning affects that. And then we can look in some detail about what this does to both the air in a room and the air local to a person. So we use a method here called age of air, which is like a proxy for how clean the air is. Imagine the air when it comes out, the nozzle is clean. It has an age of zero. And the longer it's there, the older the air is that you're breathing. And what we can see in these, this, the, 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 this little image shows the air in the room. So you've got the PV nozzle and the person. And then the other image shows what it is on the person's face. And we can see that when, the, when you've got this jet very close to the person, as you might expect, you get a much cleaner air, it's much lower age. When you move the, the jet quite a long way away, the age of the air is quite, quite high. And what it does is it changes the airflow in the room as well. So you can see the changing in the flow pattern in the room. So the two things all interact together. Second example I will show you is around is a completely different example. So this is around air disinfection. So using ultraviolet radiation to model how um, inter how we can inactivate microorganisms. So this is widely used. Many of you will have come across this in microbiology labs. We use it in all sorts of places, but it can be used in air systems, in buildings um, to inactivate microorganisms. Um, and there are oops, oh, that one. There are different ways of doing it. You can have one which is called an upper room system, whereby you put the UV high up in a room and it, it uses convection currents to disinfect the air. Or the one I'm going to talk about, which is where you put it in a ventilation duct. So this thing that looks a little bit like a magic wand would be our UV lamp, and the air passes over that. Um, theory of it's very simple. Um, in practice, though, it's actually quite complicated because it depends on the lamps, it depends on the airflow, and it depends on the microorganisms that you're interested in. Um, again, what we can do with this is to model this. So we can actually model the three-dimensional radiation field that you get from that UV lamp. We can model the tracks of particles through that duct, and we can simulate then how much radiation they receive and that allows us to understand what their likely inactivation is going to be. Um, and just to show you an example of, of how the CFD tells us some more information, this is, so there are a set of tests done by the US EPA on um, UV disinfection for different microorganisms. And we can model that in the CFD. You can see we're not doing pretty, we're doing pretty well there. We've got similar measures in here. Now, if you do a test, what you basically do is you inject your microorganism upstream of the lamp, 
you switch, you measure it downstream of the lamp and you measure it with and without the lamp on. Um, you take a number of samples, you get a mean, probably a standard deviation on that, and that will tell you your inactivation. What it doesn't tell you is anything about the spatial distribution of that inactivation. And what you start finding is it when you put, imagine this square of the graph is the duct and there's the lamp, what you start finding is some of the particles that go down there, the ones that pass very close to the lamp, get a very high dose. The ones in the corners get a much lower dose. And if you get to the end of, you take from the model, you take a distribution, you find you get a distribution that looks something like this. Okay. Now, if you just calculate it from your experiment, you would calculate just the mean here. So this is the average, do average dose that they would receive. But what you can see is that all of these particles here got less than the average dose, and all of these particles here got more than the average dose. Now, if you need the average dose to be inactivated, well, this lot are under inactivated, so we've now only got, I know, 39%. All this lot have got more than they need. So actually, that, that system, as it's designed, is both inefficient, because it's use, wasting energy up here, and ineffective, because it's not irradiating these ones enough. If you just do it by experiment, you can't figure that out, because you don't know why you've got 39%. You can't figure out the distribution. But the modeling actually tells you something about that distribution. And um, you could do this in more detail. So this is a... Uh, this is the lamp we've just seen where it was perpendicular to the, to the duct. We can actually do it with it parallel to the duct as well. And we can see we get a different average dose, exactly the same lamp, but different orientation. You get a different answer. Um, and you get a slightly different distribution in here. And we can use this to build up information about system design. So here is, uh, here is all the particles in a perpendicular lamp. What you can see is they're all quite clustered. When we put the parallel lamp, we get a different shape. So we get some particles with very high distributions who have low residence times. They go very close to the lamp. And then we get some with very low doses that are a long way from it. And, but without the modeling, you can't unpick this at all. It's not 100% perfect, but it tells you something about what you should be looking for and how the system works. OK, I'm, how am I doing for time? I'm probably. Seven minutes, excellent, right, I can do the rest in seven minutes. Okay, so the second part I want to talk about is how we can link some of this into risk modeling. Um, so when we're talking about airborne infection, the most famous common equation for modeling air flow, uh, airborne infection risk is something called a Wells-Riley model. Um, this came from work around tuberculosis in the uh, 1950s, 60s. Um, but it's very widely used. It has anybody who does mathematical modeling can spot some flaws in it. It does have plenty, but it's still quite useful. And it's a, an intra, it's a useful and fairly simple model, which basically says the number of infections that you get will depend on how many people you've got in your room, um, will depend on your the number of infectors I, um, their pulmonary ventilation rate, so the breathing rate P, the time spent there, the room ventilation rate Q capital Q, and then this little Q is something called the quanta. This is the, the slightly dodgy parameter in this, but it basically represents um, the, the amount of um, infectious material in the air and the susceptibility of the people to that material. Um, and this is quite widely used for, for um, modeling transmission risks and not necessarily modeling it seriously accurately, but understanding which of these parameters is going to matter to you. This is a very simple deterministic um, representation of this. When you start doing it in multiple spaces, you realize your ventilation, you can't just put in a single number here. So you have to formulate this differently for multiple spaces. Um, you also have to deal with this differently when you've got small numbers of people, because it doesn't work in a deterministic way. But you can do a stochastic version of it. So just to give you an example of, of some work we've done around, this is about trying to model hospitals, so multi-bed hospital wards. We've got bays in a hospital. Each bay has six patients in it, and then we've got a connecting corridor there. And then we've got a ventilation pattern between each, each bay. Um, so we'll have some, some air mixing, which just happens. Um, and then we've got some which might be forced by the ventilation. And we start off with somebody infectious in zone uh, 1A. Um, and we can model the ventilation 
flow, the distribution of that quanta of infection, either by a ventilation network model or a computational fluid dynamics model, um, and then a, a stochastic version of the Wells-Riley equation to look at risk in here. Um, and this was some of the, 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 the flows that we've looked at with computational fluid dynamics. This was actually a really nice little bit of work that one of my undergraduate students did for me this year. Um, it is a sort of representative to try and understand how those flows might work. So you can see here where the, the air inlets, jets are, you get these, these high velocity areas in here. And then you can see for different ventilation regimes, if you release particles, sometimes those particles might transfer from one bay to another, sometimes they might contain them more in a bay. So it depends on how you've designed that ventilation. Um, so she looked at a whole ro load of different ventilation regimes. I've just got two on here. So ventilation regime B is where essentially the air is put into the, the base of bottom of the ward and extracted at the corridor. And this ventilation C is, vice, is the opposite direction where it's put into the corridor and extracted here. And what you can see is both the, the analytical model and the computational model, they show the same trends. And they show what you would expect to see in that the zone which is closest to the infectious patient has the highest concentration of infectious material. As you go further down the ward, you get less and less of that as it reduces down. You can also see that the, the two models perform slightly differently and you get the biggest variation close to the source, which is, what, again, what you might expect. That is where you're going to get the greatest uncertainty in there. And we can put this all together and model what we might want to think about seeing in terms of risk. I think this is assuming a tuberculosis. I can't remember exactly, but I think it's assuming tuberculosis um, and what those risks might be for those patients. And, you know, it, it doesn't say that this, this is, is definitely better than this or vice versa. What it tells you about is the, the relative importance of the different factors and allows you to start to understand, well, what might be happening here? What things might matter to us? And therefore, where should we go and look? And which things do we think we can probably ignore? Which things do we think are going to be important in this? Um, just the last little bit about this is, that can we take this, what's in the air, and link it onto surfaces? So. If stuff is in the air, how does it deposit and what happens in there? This is quite a complex thing to understand because you need to know not just about the air now, you need to know where the pathogen source is, where your deposition is, and then you need to know about something about who touches what and where and what, they, what they're going to do about it. So we have a model for this, um, which is about pathogen pickup on the hands. So we might say if we've got a certain number of germs on a surface, um, how much do you pick, if you touch a surface, how much do you pick up? Each time, if you've got something on your hand, how much do you put back every time you touch a surface? What's the contact area of your hand with a particular surface? And how effectively do you clean your hands? Um, and then we add this together. So we have a computational fluid dynamics model which looks at pathogen deposition onto surfaces. We then put this model into something called a Markov chain model, which allows you to understand the repeated contact contacts. And then it's all done as a probabilistic driven model using a Monte Carlo approach to, to, to see the, the, to quantify the uncertainty in it. And we actually link this with a load of data from observations in a hospital. So we went into a hospital, measured, marked up all the surfaces, recorded and observed where people touch surfaces. And you get things that look a little bit like this. So a healthcare worker might go in, touch the bed, touch the patient, touch the equipment, touch the bed, et cetera, again. We got about 400 of these, these um, observations and were able to then create probability distributions for the sequence of contacts that were likely to happen in those environments. Once you put those together, we can actually do some comparisons. So this is a scenario where you've got four patients in single rooms versus four patients in a multi-bed room. Um, patient one has something nasty, and then healthcare worker goes to patient one, then to patient two, to patient three, to patient four. And when you run the model, you can then look at the probability that they will have contamination on their hands after patient one, patient two, patient three, patient four. And you can see in the single room scenario, that probability drops off 
as they go between the patients. There's always some outliers here because these are the ones where they didn't wash their hands. Um, but when you put it in the multi-bed room, you realize you end up with a non-zero probability, um, and that's because the environment is contaminated. And in a way, it's not, it's not rocket science. I had to get that on the end. Had to, somebody had to say it, didn't they? It's common sense, isn't it, that, that this is going to happen, but it actually allows us to quantify it and say what that risk might be, and therefore look at factors like the ventilation rate. Um, just to very quickly show you some of the work we were looking at at the moment, this is to try and model these things in real time and understand the transients. So this is a real-time computational fluid dynamics model of a hospital ward with a, maybe it's an alien doctor, this one. Um, so but it's colored by temperature, so you can see the thermal plumes rising from somebody's head. You can move the ventilation around. Um, we're trying to use these sorts of models to understand what might be happening and then understand how actually those transient changes might affect it. So um, although this is a video, it is actually a real-time model that you can interact with. Um, um, and then just to very quickly finish up, um, so I've talked a little bit around modeling, some of the things we can do, how we can characterize the environment, um, and how we can couple these things together. And you know, it, it, it doesn't tell you all your answers, but it might tell you where to go and look. And if you're gonna go and design an experiment, actually perhaps it tells you those parameters that matter for your experiment rather than the ones that, that don't. I just thought I would say a little bit about what the implications for this are in space. So um, I'm aware that there is a lot of work that's been done on modeling um, ventilation flows and air flows um, on the space station. Um, there's not that much out there in the public domain. I guess there's probably a lot more that's not in the public domain, um, but there is some out there. I think a lot of that focus is around the comfort and the CO2 concentrations. I'm not aware, I couldn't find anything on particle deposition, well, not, dis not deposition, dispersion, but there may well be some of that out there too. Um, I guess the fact the air is all recirculated comes into it. What's the filter efficiencies in there? Um, perhaps some of the work on UV modeling might be relevant to that. Uh, we've heard already a lot about the, the microgravity environment. So those convective flows will all be completely different. The deposition, obviously it deposits because of the momentum flows onto the filter surfaces and things rather than depositing onto other surfaces. I suspect there'll be differences in the aerosolization and things as well. I'm sure there's a, there's a whole load of uh, fluids work that, that people will know about that I don't in this space. Um, and with that, I'll just say thank you. These are all the people whose work appeared today in my talk. Thank you.